The 26th was a calm evening in central Alabama and southwest Mississippi. The Storm Prediction Center and National Weather Service were urging the public to prepare for a possible tornado outbreak that would unfold the next day. But there was no amount of preparation in the world that would prepare everybody for what was about to happen. Within the next 24 hours, hundreds of tornadoes would change many towns for good and leave hundreds of lives and families permanently affected and scarred for life. In this short documentary, we will look into the tornado outbreak sequence that caused all of this to unfold and touch on some of the horrific tornadoes that solidified this day into the history books and unfortunately, the minds of many victims. As the sun set, the terror would begin. This is the story of April 27th, 2011, the super outbreak. But first, let's look back at 2011 as a whole before the 27th. The year 2011 started off pretty quiet with January only having nine tornadoes across the United States, which is a little bit below average. February was more significant, with over 63 tornadoes occurring across the US, 13 of them being EF2+, injuring nine and killing one. March would be considered average, with around 75 tornadoes across the US, with nine being significant, injuring 17 and killing one. Then we have April. If you've never investigated historic weather before, you're looking at history right here. This is the most active tornado month ever recorded, as well as one of the most deadly, killing over 363 people in one month. There were two extremely notable outbreak sequences in the month of April. The April 14th through 16th, which had some major tornadoes crossing through areas near Jackson, Mississippi and Tuscaloosa, Alabama. An ironic note considering what other outbreak sequence happened a few days later. It's also good to note the tornadoes that happened in North Carolina and Virginia on the 16th. Then there's the April 25th through the 28th sequence. April 27th alone killed over 300 people and injured almost 3,000. What made this sequence so significant, but more importantly, so deadly? A moderate risk is situated across areas of East Texas, Southeast Oklahoma, Northwest Louisiana, and Central Arkansas. A massive convective complex is roaring across the Ozarks in Central Arkansas at the time. A cluster of supercells shoot out ahead of the squall, which already produced two strong tornadoes previously. Around 6 p.m., the first really notable tornado of the day forms. This tornado was rated EF3 and tracked for 17 miles, sadly killing one person. The same supercell would produce another EF2 around 6.40 p.m. This tornado was 1.6 miles wide and tragically killed four people during its very long 68 mile trek through the Ozarks. Around midnight, a short-lived but destructive tornado impacted the Fort Campbell Army Airfield and was rated EF3, barely leaving the perimeter of the field. April 26 was a high-risk day, with a 30% chance of significant tornadoes over the exact same region as the day before. There were a few EF2s on the 26, one of which was a rain-wrapped tornado near Shreveport, Louisiana that tracked 42 miles, but nothing extremely notable happened this day. If anything, the most notable thing the 26 did was set the stage for the horrific events that would unfold across the southeast the following day, where some of the most volatile conditions ever recorded would assemble over the southeast and unleash hell on earth. And unfortunately, we are under the greatest risk possible for tornadoes. And uh, I mean, we're pulling out all the stops. We're under what's called a high risk for a lot of severe weather, including long track, strong to violent tornadoes. Birmingham, Aniston, Gadsden, Huntsville areas, Tuscaloosa, we're in the bullseye of where this may occur. We could see just a horrific event 
unfold for us. I, I, I really have been saying a lot of prayers because I think this is going to be a very nasty outbreak of severe weather today. The supercell near Shreveport from the previous day forms into a large squall line with embedded supercells overnight and enters Mississippi very early on the next morning. This portion of the event was extremely notable, mainly due to the large amount of tornadoes that all happened extremely early in the morning, and a lot of them being very strong, which is normally not common from a squall line. This graph shows the tornadoes that happened on the morning of the 27th alone. These tornadoes, as well as the intense straight line winds that occurred across Mississippi and Alabama, would knock out power and cell communications across the states. These outages would later be detrimental as it would cripple the stream of information from news agencies and the National Weather Service to the public. This is believed to be a contributing factor to the tragically high death toll this day. At around 1.30 p.m., supercell thunderstorms begin to fire in the open warm sector. And around 2.30 p.m., the supercell just to the northeast of Jackson, just outside of the town of Philadelphia, goes on to produce the first violent tornado of the day. The Philadelphia Mississippi EF5 was the first EF5 of the outbreak, which had maximum estimated wind speeds of 205 miles an hour and tracked for 28 miles, unfortunately killing three people who were all at the time inside of the same mobile home. This tornado at one point scoured pavement from roads and ripped two feet of topsoil out of the ground, leaving fields completely ruined. This ground scouring is still one of the most intense spots of damage ever recorded by a tornado and is still the deepest ever recorded ground scouring from a tornado. This tornado, keep in mind, was happening in conjunction with the Coleman EF4, which developed in northern Alabama exactly 10 minutes after Philadelphia and would drill into the ground for 47 miles, killing six. At around 2.50 p.m., the new Wren EF3 develops, which is the direct predecessor to the Smithville EF5, which I will shortly be talking about, but I just wanted to mention it for context purposes. At around 3.05 p.m., the Phil Campbell and Hackleberg EF5 would develop just near Hamilton, Alabama. This tornado was on the ground for a whopping 132 miles, the longest tornado path of the day and had estimated maximum wind speeds of greater than 210 miles an hour. As a result, multiple towns were very violently damaged or completely torn apart. A Wrangler Jeans plant, which was constructed to purposefully withstand high-end tornadic winds, was completely obliterated. The Browns Ferry nuclear power plant had an extremely close call to the tornado, but regardless, they had to scram all three reactors offline because of loss of external power. Which because of the reactors being offline, and many transmission lines being down in and around the area, a large portion of northern Alabama would lose power, as this is the second largest nuclear power plant active in the United States. This tornado, unfortunately, would go on to kill 71 people along its 132 mile long path making it the deadliest tornado of the entire outbreak. Around 3.40 p.m., shortly after the new Ren EF3 dissipated, the Smithville EF5 would literally drill into the ground, immediately producing damage reminiscent of only the highest end tornadoes. Within the tornado's 37 mile long path, it managed to do some of the most intense damage ever recorded from a tornado, had estimated winds of 205 miles an hour, tragically killing 23 people, mostly in the town of Smithville alone. The Smithville tornado would go on to produce ground scouring similar to the Philadelphia EF5 that formed an hour earlier, which is evident in aerial shots toward the beginning of its life. This tornado did such an assortment of violent damage, I'm just going to mainly list the extreme damage indicators that were found in the town of Smithville on the screen in front of you, and I'll provide a few pictures here right now just to showing a few of the damage indicators, as some of the pictures are a little bit iffy for me to use. I personally think from the sheer damage that Smithville caused in such a short amount of time, 
I'd say it's probably one of the more scary tornadoes of the outbreak, definitely sitting up there with tornadoes like Hackleburg and Rainsville, which I will be explaining here soon. One thing remains unchanged though, and that is Smithville is one of the strongest tornadoes to ever touch down on this planet, and most likely will be for an extremely long time, almost uncontested. At 4.45 p.m., the most infamous tornado of the day would appear on the ABC 3340 Skycam, touching down just southwest of the city of Tuscaloosa. This tornado was rated EF4, with estimated peak wind speeds of 190 miles an hour, sadly killing 64 people and injuring a whopping 1,500 people. This tornado went straight through the center of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, a city which at the time had a population of around 89,000 people and would continue for 80 miles into the northern suburbs of the Birmingham metro. The Tuscaloosa-Birmingham tornado alone caused $2.4 billion in damages, giving it the title of, at the time, the costliest tornado in recent records, which was only held for a short time until the Joplin EF5 happened in May of the same year. The most interesting areas of damage in my personal opinion with Tuscaloosa are the apartment complexes which were almost completely obliterated on this northeast side of Tuscaloosa, as well as the railroad bridge which was completely collapsed also off to the northeast of Tuscaloosa, where it most likely peaked in strength. At 6.20 p.m., the final EF5 of the day would touch down southwest of Fife, Alabama. This tornado would go on to be known as the Rainsville Tornado, as it went directly through the center of town, tracking 36 miles. An entire concrete porch was reportedly removed from one house, as well as a gun safe ripped from another home's foundation, also reportedly having the door and lock torn off. The safe weighed several hundred pounds and was tossed several hundred meters. This is all that remains of a school bus, ripped down to the frame and drivetrain, completely mangled by the tornado. This tornado had estimated wind speeds of greater than 200 miles an hour, and in my opinion, produced some of the strongest tornado damage out of the 27th. The day, however, was still not over as the risk continued into the night over areas of northwestern Georgia and southern Tennessee, where more strong EF4s would tear across the landscape. The same supercell that produced the Rainsville tornado would go on to produce the strongest tornado in Georgia history, Ringle, with estimated wind speeds over 190 miles an hour, tracking up to 48 miles long, killing 20 people and injuring 335. The damage looking all too familiar with the tornadoes that happened earlier on in the afternoon. Finally, extremely slowly but surely, the outbreak begins to come to an end as most of the storms start getting into central to southern Tennessee and begin to dissipate as the night goes on. This is the end of the onslaught for the southern states, but the damage had already been done and the lives have already been affected. $10.2 billion in damages were recorded across multiple states, officially making April 27, 2011, the most costly tornado outbreak in the United States history. The outbreak reportedly killed 324 people and injured over 3,000 others. April 27 had officially solidified itself into the history books is one of the worst natural disasters to ever strike this country and was officially dubbed a super outbreak, only being comparable to the events of April 3rd, 1974. Meteorologically, almost everything went right this day, unfortunately meaning that everything went wrong for the citizens of the Southeast. I would like to shortly mention the amazing job done by the NWS offices in the region such as Birmingham and Jackson, as well as many others. Also, including the Birmingham ABC 3340 Storm Team, at the time consisting of Jason Simpson and James Spann, 
broadcasting the entire day of the morning tornadoes all the way into the night. News broadcast shows like ABC 3340, the National Weather Service, and also EMS teams stationed around the states all helped contribute to helping people in and after the event. Today, many of these towns have rebuilt and continue to improve after these violent tornadoes trashed them. Sadly, not all towns have the same story, and some, unfortunately, still remain permanently scarred from the monsters that once ravaged these poor people and their unfortunate property on this fateful day.